on the, on the, on the side. Okay, and he you just told me. Middle. All right, I just get a different order. Okay, so sorry. You changed? Yeah, we just okay. changed, apparently. Like the the man to differentiate, that's a good yeah. thing. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm... All right, your mics are all live, so <coughs> just so you know. Good morning, uh, and welcome. Delighted to see such a, a great turnout at the German Marshall Fund at this uh, early hour of the morning, and we welcome our uh, various uh, guests that are here, Ambassador, our President, Karen Donfried, and others. Let me just... I'm Jim Colby. I'm a senior transatlantic fellow here at the German Marshall Fund, and my role this morning is quite limited. All I need to do is to welcome you, and to introduce our moderator and the guests, and they will take it away from there. But we are particularly happy to have you here as part of this Understanding America project, which is something the German Marshall Fund uh, has begun uh, in order to, to try to understand uh, of the geopolitical, the, to examine the social uh, political development of the United States and the impact that it's having on the US-European uh, relations and, and transatlantic relationship. Uh, in line with this, uh, with, with GM's, GMF's mission to strengthen transatlantic relations, these conversations that we're having under this project of the Understanding America uh, focuses on unpacking, uh, analyzing, translating these trends for our allies and uh, partners in Europe. And we have an especially good group here the, this morning, a trio, I should say, to, uh, to undertake this effort in the post of midterm elections of the United States to understand where we are and where politics in the United States is likely to be going in the uh, months and years ahead before the next uh, uh, general election that includes the presidential election. Uh, many, I think most of you know, I won't go into great detail on the bio biographies of our uh, guests here this morning. I think most of you know, let me just introduce them by very briefly, uh, over there on the other side from me is Bill Crystal, who is the editor of Weekly Standard. He's a regular on ABC this week and contributes to a number of their special uh, events. He has a long history going back, working with the Republican Party, uh, the project for the Republican future when I was in Congress uh, that helped to bring about the Republican majority in 1994. He served as chief of staff to Vice President Dan Quayle and to the Education Secretary, William Bennett, under, under Ronald Reagan. So he's been, he's been a professor at the Kennedy School of Government. So somebody that's written, and I think most, most everybody has seen him on television at one time or another. Similarly, near attendant in the center here, the president and CEO of the Center for American Progress, as well as the CEO of the Center for uh, American Progress Action Fund, uh, is somebody that has been very active in the Democratic Party for a long time. Uh, she uh, has been a, a senior advisor for health reform at the Department of Human and Health Services. She has a long history going back with the Obama and Clinton administration, served uh, and worked as a policy advisor for Senator Clinton uh, uh, when she ran for, uh, for, the, for president in 2008, when she ran for Senate uh, in 2000. She's been an advisor all along and particularly in the area of health health care. Uh, so she is uh, somebody that has a long history of being involved in American politics as well as the, the policy issues. And finally, last but certainly not least, let me introduce our moderator. Uh, Julian Schwabel is the US correspondent for Das Der Tagesspiegel. Uh, and before moving to Washington, uh, she was the political department director of that uh, paper. She has more than 10 years of experience in business and political re, uh, reporting for uh, Der Tagesspiegel. And she has been involved in a lot, lot of political conferences uh, and been uh, even involved in some conferences that the German Marshall Fund has, has done before. Uh, so we have somebody that has a great deal of experience covering the American political scene uh, and very fortunate to have her as moderator. And so with that, I turn it over to you, Julian. It's yours. Thank you so much and good morning, everybody. I'm Happy that you all found the way here this, uh, this early, um, and it's an honor to be here for me. Um, it's one month after the midterms, um, and we still, not, not all races are decided yet, but we have a clear picture of what has happened, I guess, and I guess um, you can delight, enlighten us even more of what has happened. The Democrats have gained about 40 House seats and um, lost two seats in the Senate. 
Um, some have spoken much about the blue wave that is, um, that is going to happen. I just wanted to ask you, how big was the success of the Democratic Party in reality? And the question goes to both of you. Well, I really think it's fair if I start. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so if you look at the overall numbers, um, we had a historic election in the sense that there was this large scale turnout uh, in the midterms. And uh, actually, the number of Republicans that turned out was higher than I think any recent midterm, so much higher than even 2010, when which Republicans took 60 seats. Now, what was really, I mean, obviously instructive about the night is that Democratic turnout, or turnout uh, of voters who voted for Democratic candidates uh, really just swamped that. So, oh, oh sorry. Um, oh, great. <laughs> uh, so essentially, uh, we had almost, I think at this point, 9 million more people vote for Democratic candidates and Republican candidates, which is the highest difference. It's about an 8% 8 difference perhaps getting close to 9%, which is the largest difference between the parties in, I believe, 100 years. So uh, I think one of the challenges Democrats faced throughout this cycle was that we have historic levels of gerrymandering where uh, districts were drawn in post-2010. I know other countries don't have this. Uh, but districts were drawn to basically favor Republicans in a lot of parts of the country. And so... Uh, for Democrats to even take the majority, it would have taken, you know, it's like we needed a lot more people to vote for Democrats. So the fact that it was 40 seats, which I think is an incredible, uh, incredibly high number, and it may well be 41 because of the shenanigans in North Carolina 9, um, I do think that that is a historic, uh, historic uh, blue wave, much higher than the last wave of, last Democratic wave of 2006, in terms of votes higher than 2010, 2014. So I think I think it's fair to say it's a democratic wave. Do you agree? Yes, I do agree. And uh, but I'll say a word or two more. Um, first of all, it's good to be here with friends from the German Marshall Fund. I've had a long uh, on and off relationship with, with GMF <laughs> under Craig and Karen, and uh, I have a very high opinion of the work that GMF has done and does. I think this is an impossible project, on the other hand, understanding America. <laughs> Maybe you should give it a different title, you know, sort of, you know, thinking about America or something, or discussing America. Psychoanalyzing America exactly. is really what I think. Being bewildered by America, something like that. It's work in focus. Um, so, yeah, look, it was a big election. I think the turnout point is important. I don't know that people have quite focused on that. If you, It was an extremely high turnout, closer to a presidential year mm -hmm. than to an off year. Why does that matter? I mean, there was tur increased turnout on both sides, so it's not clear which way the turnout, so to speak, affected the relative result. But it's important because it means it was a more accurate snapshot of where the public is likely to be in 2020. Yeah. In a normal off-year election, if you just have a depressed turnout by the in party, the Democrats in 2010, for example, it doesn't really tell you what's going to happen when, in that case, President Obama is on the ballot as opposed to a bunch of congressmen who people haven't heard of much and they're a little unhappy and they want to check the president. This was such a big turnout that it, I think, gives you a pretty good snapshot of where the country is. And where the country is is very consistent across the branches. If you just ignore the redistricting for a minute, if you ignore even the fact that the Senate obviously is, you know, done by states and they have very different populations. If you look at governor's races, Democrats now govern about 53, 54% of the country. It's about evenly split. I think it's 25, 25, actually. I think but it's 26, 24. 26, 24. But in Democrats evenly. have slightly larger states, so it's 53, 47. The Senate is, if you look at the states, again, the population of the states with Democratic or Republican senators, it's actually about the same, 53, 54, to 47, 46. The House is literally, I think, 53, 47. Mm -hmm. In this case, the, the number of the seats mirrored the actual, almost mirrored the popular vote. Um, so basically, the country and the Democrats picked up about 400 state legislative seats. They're still a little bit behind in that because of sort of leftover uh, Republican seats that they held and, and, and some gerrymandering at the state level. But basically, the country is you know, has a negative verdict on President Trump. It was all about Trump. 
It wasn't in my district in Northern Virginia, right across the river. It wasn't the people that suddenly decided they didn't like Barbara Comstock when they liked her two years ago. They decided they wanted a Democratic House to check the president. I'll come back to that in one second. But I would say, generally speaking, I think it's a pretty good, as I say, snapshot of where the country is. And in my opinion, where it's likely to be two years from now. That is, it's hard to believe the economy is going to be better than it was in this election. The eco good economy helps the incumbent party. It's hard to believe the world is going to look a lot say I mean, the, the world is not in terrible shape. It maybe it is in terrible shape, really. But on the surface, there were no obvious disasters this time. No Vietnam, no Iraq without a WMD, and so forth. So trade wars hadn't really taken off, even if they looked like they were dangerous. So there was no real negative verdict there for Trump. Democrats didn't really run on that much. Um, so it was, Trump put himself at the center of the election, and I think a lot of it was a referendum on Trump. So I would say the country is now minus seven, minus eight, negative on Trump. Let's just say 54, 46, to be sort of simple-minded and get rid of all the minor parties. Now, the good news for Democrats is that's good. I mean, it's, as I say, it's unlikely to change, in my opinion. I mean, a million things could happen, but if, if, if ap most of the things that would happen, I think, would hurt Trump, not help him. But of course, who knows? Who knows who the Democrats will nominate, et cetera? But it, it, right now, Democrats have the upper hand. The caveat would be that it's not a massive upper hand. I mean, 53, 47, 54, 46 is an advantage, but it's not 60, 40. It's not 70, 30. And the Republicans turn out, voters turned out. And the way the Electoral College works, you can write scenarios where Trump squeaks through again, losing the popular vote and so forth. But I think it was a pretty big, uh, pretty big election in the sense that it wasn't the kind of normal off year, people just don't show up, and that leads to the result. And it wasn't a case where local issues mattered much. I mean, what's most striking is if you told us the demographics of a district, we could tell you the result almost regardless of the candidates. Candidates do matter still, especially at the governor level, I would say, and senator level. But in the House, it didn't really matter. You could be a very good congressman. You could be a bad congressman. If you were in a well-educated suburban district that were especially women, but men too, had turned against Trump, the Republican lost. If you were in a more rural or exurban, less well-educated, older, more white district, the Republican won, and demography was destiny. I don't think that's very healthy for the country, honestly. It's better to have elections where people debate issues as opposed to an election where people just show up and register, it's sort of like a census turned into an election. But having said that, uh, this is the way the country is. We are polarized at this point in various, along various socioeconomic criteria. <laughs> And that's what this election it was it resulted. In that respect, it was 2016, but more so. And 2016 itself was, of course, a continuation of earlier trends. So in that respect, if you hope for more bipartisanship, less polarization, more of a you know America working together and less red and blue America, I don't think it was an encouraging election, at least in the short term. We come back to that sure. working together thing. I just wanted to ask if that's such an overall optimistic message for the Democratic Party. I'm a little bit surprised that it's that optimistic. But what are the mistakes the Democratic Party can do in the in the run to 2020? I mean, Nira, it's, Nira is an expert on that. It's the Democratic Party. This will, be, this will take up the rest of the time, uh, and that'll be that'll be it. You know? uh, well, I think too, I'll, say insights, few, I'll say a few. I'll say a few things about. Uh, uh, to build on, I, 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 I guess I would disagree. I do think candidates did matter. Uh, Will Hurd survived uh, in Texas, like it came very close, but uh, he survived in Texas, I think, because he was a good candidate who also distanced himself from Trump or figured out the magic sauce to do that. Um, I, he's the exception, not the rule. But I do think good, uh, it wasn't, I, I do think candidates still matter at the Congressional Senate and gubernatorial level. Um, I, I think the important thing to say is about 2020, just for one, um, I'll just make really two points. Uh, first, Democrats did really well in three states that Trump won. Wisconsin, they won every statewide elected office. Michigan, they won almost every state. I think won actually almost every statewide or every, almost every statewide. The gubernatorial candidate won by eight points. Um, Pennsylvania, uh, Democrats did very well when the Senate race and the governor governor's re-election. Those weren't super competitive, but uh, House turnout was very high for Democrats. So those were three states that were critical to Trump's election, in which he sort of, you know, got the seventy thousand votes, and 
Democrats did well, not by you know thousands of votes, but really high levels of percentage, particularly in Michigan and Pennsylvania. And Wisconsin was tighter at the governor's level. But when you really look um, at the numbers, it's another state that went 53, 47 in terms of how it's a gerrymandered uh, district, statewide, state districts, state Senate, assembly districts are gerrymandered, but high turnout for Democrats over Republicans. So I think those are important issues. And when you unpack that, one of the most important things is um, there's two things that have really happened, I think, in the last two years that I think are structural problems for President Trump. One is Hillary Clinton won white college-educated women by, I think, 53, 47, 57. 52, 48, it was relatively close. But she did better than any Democrat has done before with white college educated women. That group went 60, 40, 62, 38 against the president. So the last two years have really made college educated women, both suburban and urban, you know, disproportionately suburban and urban, the backbone of the resistance to Donald Trump. I mean, if you, I worked on the for defending the ACA, uh, I've been part of every major political march. It is the, it is white suburban, white college educated women, basically mothers, 35 to 55, who are the activists around this. And this is, as Bill knows, just a mere decade or two ago, these women were the backbone of the Republican Party. Uh, I mean, they used to be like 65, 35 Republican in the 90s, uh, and they have they have radically shifted. Now, Trump has done much better with working class, non-college educated whites. Uh, Hillary did terribly with white non-college women. So, well, it's been well mined over the last two years. Importantly, in the Midwest, white non-college women went, you know, 45% for for Trump when they had been at 45% for Democrats when they'd only been like 32 or 33 for Democrats with Hillary. That is a significant shift. And I think really what was happening in the last two weeks or three weeks of that campaign was uh, Donald Trump actually effectively mobilized his voters. He mobilized uh, white working class voters and uh, they voted at a much, I mean, important for Democrats to recognize, they voted at a much higher rate than they voted in the special elections. So they've, uh, white, rural, non-college voters voted um, at like 50, 55, 60 when it was Connor Lamb or Alabama or even Danny O'Connor. They turned out at like 65, 68% for, on, uh, and I do think the caravan and the discretion of immigrant immigrants, and I would argue immigrant bashing, contributed to that. But I think the big focus on healthcare and pre-existing conditions really pulled a lot of white non-college women back to the Democratic Party. And I think that coalition is, I'm not saying it's, I think it's a, it's, it's not, you know, I think getting those voters is an, is an important issue. The fact that Democrats were able to pull them back is important. I think that'll be a critical part of the presidential debate. It's a precar I'm, it's precarious, you know. Trump knows this. He's going to do what he can to bring those voters back to him, and I think that's I think that is going to be a big part of the next two years, which is uh, those voters and who gets them in the end. I just circumvented a little bit the question of what the mistakes are the Democratic Party could do in the next two years. I mean, you're asking me a hypothetical question of how Democrats could screw up in an election in two years, well, which, you know, I could, I could say, like, I am, I have, uh, I have been on multiple campaigns, so I could say, <laughs> are you, there's like a million scenarios you could come up with how Democrats could screw up. Uh, I think, I think the, so I'll say it at this broad level. Democrats won because they had an and strategy. They, they put, uh, there's all this discussion before the election of whether millennials and Latinos and African Americans would turn out, and generally speaking, they don't they don't turn out in midterms at very high levels. W Democrats won because those groups turned out. They also won because they were able to pull uh, white non college voters T to win the presidency. Democrats have to do both of those things. There are times where it might seem those things might be in conflict. They have to master the way to basically build a coalition that has reaches out to voters that haven't voted Democratic and pulls 
the base of the Democratic Party into the election. In 2016, that became a choice. Uh, those things seemed in conflict. In 2020, they have to figure to do both of those things. They did it in opposition to Trump. Whether a candidate can do that is a big question. If they have to make a choice, it's going to be a really long election night, and it will be much more like 2016 than 2018. Yeah, I mean, I think that's key. And so, and if, one, if they were a Trump representative here as opposed to an anti-Trump Republican like me, here's what he or she would say. <laughs> uh, look, it was an off-year election. Trump was not on the ballot. And people voted for Democrats, and there's some truth to this, for the House especially, to check Trump. But that's not what 2020 is going to be. There already will be a Democratic House. There's going to be a Democratic House after the 2020 election unless it's really astonishing Republican wave. So people can feel that Trump is now a little bit in check. And in fact, the Democratic House will do whatever they do for the next two years. And some of those things may not be very attractive to some of those swing voters who went Democratic temporarily. So those voters have been, you know, rented, not bought, or whatever the yeah. metaphor is. Uh, they're on loan to the Democratic Party. And the Democratic Party could do things in power, yeah. especially in the House. Yeah. Trump could do things conceivably that would bring them back. I think that's a little harder to see given that he is who he is, and so much of his appeal is so adverse to the values and to some degree the interest, but more the values and the temperament, I would say, especially of these of these swing voters. But I can, in my district, which is a swing district, uh, in a semi-swing state, and other people I've talked to who are in similar situations, one can imagine a swing back towards Trump when it's a choice, if the Democratic candidate is attractive, if the Democrats have an extremely bitter primary, if Trump doesn't have a primary, we can talk about that if you want, and I'm involved in that. But it's actually important that Trump have his hands full also in 2019, 2020, and not be able to just coast to renomination while 22 Democrats are attacking each other, and Trump is cheerfully attacking them, you know, randomly and, and sequentially and causing some damage. So a scenario, and the Trump people would yeah. argue that, and again, you know, it's easier to vote for some pleasant person you've barely ever heard of, who seems like a zero sort of thing. You know, seems like a, a middle class woman, uh, maybe with military service or. That's not any better. Here, just take yeah, mine. Yeah, we'll I don't just, need one. I don't we'll think we really back. need one. We'll just go. I think they need it for okay. the video. We'll just. Go um, back with military service or a woman who worked for the CIA in the case of the district down in the Richmond suburbs, it's easy to vote for that woman. It's one congresswoman. She's not going to have any power because the Democrats only control the House, which have a little power, but she won't have much power. She can check Trump. That's good. That's an easier vote to cast if you are a traditional Republican-ish swing voter than voting for an actual Democrat for president who probably who will have a Democratic House and may have a Democratic Senate. So suddenly you're signing on to this whole Democratic agenda and you're nervous about Medicare for all and you're nervous about tax increases and you're nervous about a foreign policy that might look not just more, I hope it will look more responsible than Trump's, but it could also look like a, the usual complaints about Democratic foreign policy, which are not uh, without some merit, in my opinion. And it could look radical on social issues. There are a million things that a, a, an effective Republican campaign could do to make 2020, I think Nero put it well, a choice. 2018 was a check on Trump. 2020 is a choice between two candidates. And we've seen in many nations, if you think about elections ranging, I believe this has been true in Germany in the past, in Israel, in many places where incumbents were kind of unpopular, and they lost off-year elections, or in the case of Germany, state-level state, state level elections, and other countries have different, you know, in Britain it would be the, the uh, you know, special elections for parliamentary seats. And they lose those, and everyone says, ooh, the incumbent party's in real trouble. And suddenly it's, whoa, we actually have to decide on a prime minister, or we have to decide on a president. And it's a little like, geez, I'm not so sure these people who looked kind of attractive as a bit of a sending a message to the incumbent party and checking the incumbent party, if they, they look a little less attractive as they're going to be in charge, right? And there are many, many cases where unpopular incumbents win re-election because the out party doesn't look ready to govern. So I think it's rather important, this is your question, how the Democrats do in the House. I think it's less important, honestly, than who the Democrats nominate. At the end of the day, this is American politics. Is the presidential elections are about the people who are nominated to be president. And, you know, if you... And we'll just see who the, I mean, I hope that Republicans turn away from Trump and nominate a reasonable candidate. That's obviously uphill at this point. But there are a million Democratic candidates. And the other thing is, I don't know who the better Democrat, I mean, I don't know if I could designate a Democratic candidate to win older, more safer candidate, 
maybe that's the right message for 2020, but maybe people want change, generational change. It was enough already. Hillary and Trump, ridiculous. You know, it's like the last gasp with the baby boomers desperate never to give up <clears throat> power, having elected three presidents in a row. I wrote a piece in 2015 saying, finally, we're going to get rid of the baby boomers. You know, finally, the next generation gets a chance that it will be Rubio or Walker or Jindal or someone else. Democratic side looked like it would be Hillary. But and then we end up with Trump versus Hillary. It's really ridiculous, you know, and maybe we'll end up with Biden versus Trump. So it's even older, you know, great, you know, forward look, America, land of youth, you know, a 78 year old against a 75 year old. I mean, but so I could make a case that the Democrats would be better off with a young candidate. And I can make a case that on the other hand, you want to reassure people, you want to say we're going to get back to normal governance and you're better off with someone who's been around a while, or maybe they end up with both, or they have a ticket. But the main thing about multi-candidate races is they're unpredictable. No one, we don't get to designate, you know? Hey, 20 people are gonna run, someone's gonna get 23% in New Hampshire, and someone else is gonna get 21%, and someone else is gonna get 18%, and someone else is gonna get 16%. And that order can be important, but it's kind of random, you know, when you get to that level. So that, those are all things that I think, and I don't think Nero would disagree with this, make it, Hard to, you know, hard to be too confident that in the outcome of 2020. So, I mean, one thing I would say uh, just about this in 2020, and, and I, I actually, uh, it, my views on this are shaped by Europe, so I'll, uh, I want to put a plug for it, which is, I think, uh, I mean, there, uh, you know, could be 20 people running for president, and uh, there will be a deep, deep, robust conversation about the future of the Democratic Party. I would say a few things. First, um, the Democratic Party, successful Democratic nominees have tr have tended to be younger. So every Democrat, I think uh, my the way this goes, I had this realization a little late in 2016, but no Democrat has won the presidency who's over 52 except by death since Woodrow Wilson. So Roosevelt was 50, uh, Truman was by death, Kennedy Johnson was by death, uh, Carter was the oldest at 52, Clinton, Obama. Uh, no Republican, I believe, has won the presidency under, who's under 55, I think, since Lincoln. Um, so I think, and I see, you've already seen this in some polling, uh, I think there are phenomenal candidates who, uh, have, uh, who are older and, uh, but I do think that, that there is an interest in a next generation leader in the Democratic Party. Uh, but I, I think to take m my concern about um, the 2020 election, uh, and I have deep and profound ones, is I see, personally, I see Donald Trump in the strain of every xenophobic populist <laughs> uh, that we see on the global level. So, you know, obviously, I ha I'm not a big fan of his. So I sort of see him in the frame frame of uh, UKIP, uh, National Front, National League, and AFD. And my concern, and this is my, vi my view for the Democratic Party, is that when the nationalist populist campaigns or nationalist, camp nationalist populist parties are seen as the only alternative to the status quo, they are much more successful than when they started out. And this is my actual deep concern about Germany, which is that AFD is the opposition party. So, uh, but just back to the United States, how I think the Democratic Party should think about this is it has to, it has to have, uh, Trump still retains some power, uh, a lot of resonance for being a disruptor of the political system. And he still has, I mean, he, is not the most popular figure, et cetera, but he is doing a weird thing, which is he is an incumbent who still is seen as a disruptor of politics. And I think, you know, we can have a lot of discussion about social programs or people, whether they like single payer or not, but fundamentally, I think the Democratic nominee has to be a signifier of change so that there are two visions of change people have. If Trump is the, if the argument in 2020 is an argument about essentially the ex ante status quo versus what Trump is doing, that leaves the Democratic, Democratic Party, in my view, in a weakened position because I think every election except for 2012 has essentially been a change election. And Democrats have to own and articulate a vision of change. Absolutely matters who the candidate is. But, and if it's Joe Biden, I think it puts even more pressure on Joe Biden to have a vision of real significant policy change for the country. 
Um, and that is a lesson I've taken from essentially what's happening in, around the world, which is status quo parties are weakened because they defend the status quo. Right. And I would say it's particularly hard for central left. I mean, just looking around the world. At the some collapse. point, we'll let the moderator speak. No, we won't. Why would we? Why would we, why would we do going that? Going into a moment. Uh, yeah. I mean, central the central left has been. I mean, center right is weak, and obviously got we got defeated by Trump. On the other hand, there's still a pretty big Republican Party in the country. Merkel, May, and Macron all govern major nations. Abe, you could actually say that, despite the populist waves, the actual governance of the world is much more uniformly the center right parties in the major nations than it is has been for a long, long time. The total collapse of the center left in Europe, obviously, not mirrored here, but it does raise questions about what is the policy, what are the policies that signify change? And here, and I don't say this, I look, I hope Trump loses in 2020, but it's not, it was not, it was clever in a certain way to run up the deficit, which they succeeded in doing with the tax cuts and with no cuts in spending and no, nothing serious about entitlements. It's going to be a little, the Democrats have to look sort of fiscally responsible, I think. I mean, that's, voters would want that, I think. On the other hand, there's a huge deficit, so the, it's a little hard to propose much in the way of new spending programs. So they'll be caught in the trap that center left parties do get caught in, where they want to you know, it's hard to be both responsible and innovative. And now there are ways to get around this, and I think intelligent candidates and intelligent policy uh, uh, proposals can uh, square those circles to some degree. But the, the actual challenge of devising, I really agree with this, a central left program that doesn't look simply like a defense of the status quo um, is hard. I mean, the status quo, incidentally, may be intellectually that the status quo is perfectly worth defending and much better than these ridiculous changes, which I certainly agree with. But that's been a hard thing to sell, obviously, as as we've seen in Germany and and in elsewhere. Um, now, so now we have talked a lot about the Democratic Party, but we have to come to the uh, Republican Party, and you are still uh, still a Republican. But I want to ask you how Republican, how conservative this party still is, and who is there? Like, where is the opposition to Trump within the party? I, I think so, you're. I think you're not. Working so Trump, yeah, these mics, he's, GMF used to invest <laughs> in these mics, you know, so it's, 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 it's a classic great German manufacturing, it's shocking, I'm going to, you know, it's by American here, maybe this is American, I don't know. Um, the, uh, look, I mean, Trump dominates for now, uh, the, particularly if you're in Washington, you see congressional Republicans, they've been utterly intimidated and shamefully, I would say, uh, uh, pandering and uh, of, to Trump and rationalizing of Trump and, and refusing to take on Trump. On the end, they're not quite the same as the Republicans around the country. And I've been struck since the election, at least. If you are a governor in Arizona or New Hampshire to take two states that are actually swing states with good Republican governors, you know that you got wiped out or did very badly in the election. You also know that your state is in good shape and Republicans have done a good job governing those two states. I mean, just, and, and the governor's won re-election, Sununu in New Hampshire and Ducey in Arizona. So what happened? It wasn't, a, there was no revolt against Republican governance in those states. There was a revolt against Trump and they see that a Trump Republican party is on a path to defeat. It is a shrinking coalition, an older, whiter, less well-educated party there are going to be people are getting better educated, the country's getting more diverse, and old people are aging out, to put it politely, of the electorate, and young people are coming in, and they lost young people two to one, voters under 30, and three to two, voters up to 45. So if you put it together, it's about 63, 37. Yeah, it's astonishing, switch. it's astonishing, and there are going to be more of them and fewer of the 65 just, plus. So Just one thing, many candidates won who aligned with Trump, so it's not that Trump is, was against Trump, so in wh states, wherever he went, the people won. So. No, not true, only, well, he only he mostly went to red states, they beat very vulnerable Democrats in very Trumpy states, but I think, Look, if you just do the electoral college math and say, look at the votes that were cast in 2018, the Democrats win the presidency, and they win it pretty comfortably because they take back Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan. Florida becomes a pure toss-up. Arizona. Arizona. And they, they won probably Arizona. take Arizona, and, and, and let's say Florida's a pure toss-up. So that's a Democratic victory. It's not a massive victory, and it's a little close for comfort, and you don't know what's going to happen in a state like Wisconsin or Michigan in a, you know, on an election day, as we saw in 2016. So, but I, but I, having said all that, I think... So I think the Republican Party is, for now, Trump's party, especially the Republicans in Congress. The Republicans in the electorate, I'll just say a word about this and let's stop. You look at these polls and everyone sees this, 88% approve of Trump. And everyone goes, oh my God, how can that be? And I, as one of the 12% who don't approve of Trump, I'm a little unhappy about that too. But we've now done a lot of polling 
and some focus groups. And half, about 50% of the Republican Party is really for Trump. About 35% of the 10, 15% against Trump. 35, 40%, maybe creeping up though to, towards 50, is our reluctant Trump supporters or qualified Trump supporters or ambivalent Trump supporters. They preferred him to Hillary. They voted for him. They like some of the policies. They like the deregulation. They like pro-business. They like the judges mostly. Uh, they don't like they don't like a lot of what they see or what they have seen about the Democrats over the years. But when you ask, so so when asked by a pollster, do you approve or disapprove? That's a binary choice, and they sort of say, well, I, I kind of approve, yeah. And it's unfair. The liberal media is unfair, and you know, et cetera. They have all these kind of complaints that about how Trump's been treated. Give him a chance. He's disrupting things. That's useful, you know, et cetera, et cetera. When you ask them, and I was in a focus group, we did this. Well, so so you approve of Trump? So I guess you're fine with Trump for 2020. You want to, these are Republicans. You want to be nominated? You want to be elected? Sort of like, Oof, I'm not so sure about that, you know? I mean, it's a little crazy, and the tweeting is really insane, and there's too much divisiveness. And some disruption's good, but too much disruption is a problem, which isn't a stupid point of view, incidentally. And there's more openness among Republicans to an alternative to Trump than people think. Does that mean that if <clears throat> Jeff Flake or Ben Sass or Mitt Romney or Bob Corker or you know Larry Hogan, the governor of uh, Maryland, or anyone announced and started to run against Trump, it would it be close right now? No. Would the challenger be at zero? No. He'd be at 20 or something like that to start with, 25. Then it would depend on a couple of things, the case being made over the next year, year and a half, and a year, I guess, and honestly, on some events. I mean, if, if, if the economy is growing 4% and there's no obvious foreign policy disaster and, you know, there's no, the country isn't dissolving into riots and, you know, it looks like people can justify living with Trump, they'll live with Trump. It's the easier course. It's incumbents usually get renominated by their party. But we all, in the last 24 years, of course, incumbents have had no primary challengers, Bush, uh, Clinton, Bush, and Obama. Before that, people forget this, it was kind of common. I'm old enough to remember McCarthy challenging Johnson and driving him out, the, out of the race in 67, 68. Uh, Reagan almost beat Ford in 76. Kennedy almost beat Carter, actually. It should have probably, actually, in 80. So it's not as if American politics has never had these before. And I feel like this is more like a 60s, 70s type politics than the slightly boring almost politics or the conventional politics where the parties mobilized behind their president. Trump is too problematic for Republicans. I do think though, if you look at Congress, which is what we all do in DC, if you go up to the Hill, they're, the, gonna, be, they're gonna be a lagging indicator. If you are an actual Senator or Congressman, Jim knows this well, you've got a lot of business, if you're a Republican, You've got your friend, you want your, your former uh, legislative director who you want to get a job as deputy assistant secretary in the Commerce Department. You have people, you know, you have political pressure on you at home from Trump supporters. There are a lot of things, you have policies you care about, let's be even more high-minded. And you want to work with someone in the Trump administration to get a policy outcome that you care about. You also care about a lot of things for your district that various parts of the government can help you with. There's a lot of reasons for incumbents in Congress not to break with Trump. I don't think this is admirable. I think it's very bad that they've been so uh, subservient, but it is what it is. There's less reason if you're a governor, there's less reason if you're a state legislator, there's less reason if you're just an op sitting around Pennsylvania and saying, geez, you know, this is leading the party down the path to, to ultimate, to probably to defeat in 2020, and certainly to minority status in the future. So I'm a little more hopeful than conventional wisdom that you could get a serious challenge to Trump. And yeah, looking at the high turnout of Democratic voters who are mobilizing against Trump, would it be better for the Democratic Party if he would run again, or would you prefer another candidate? I mean, I just, if we could, I would sleep better at night myself personally if we had another candidate. So I, I think that would be basically five just for my own sleep pattern. Right? If we, if we beat Trump, it'll be so divisive. Honestly, I wouldn't maybe want to say this publicly too much, but it'll be so divisive that the Democrats will be in much better shape. And look, here's the basic fact. In modern American history, no incumbent president who has not had a primary challenge has been defeated in a general election, and every incumbent president who has had a primary challenge has lost. It is bad if you're an incumbent to have a primary challenge because yeah. normal independent voters look at it and say, gee, I mean, even 30% of his own party is kind of against them. That's not so strong. You know, they, they, it has an effect not just on the people who vote, but on the kind of people watching what's 
gone. And of course, the incumbent has to spend a lot of time and money dealing with the primary challenger. I was in the first George H.W. Bush, to speak of someone who's recently passed away and is here in uh, lying in state. You know, I was in that White House in 92. Buchanan was never going to be president of the United States, but dealing with Buchanan took time and effort and distorted our message and weirdly laid the groundwork for Perot in a way. It led the notion that you could be a Republican and be anti-Bush. That's why I think, honestly, a primary challenge will be important to defeat Trump if he's nominated, and probably even if a much better nominee is nominated, maybe it would be so exciting that that person, Ben Sass, will become the next president. But probably what would happen is the Republican Party would be badly split and the Democrats would win, unless they blow it. Uh, you know, I think just to just to diverge from Ben Sass as a candidate, um, you know, not it's something that, n- not, not that I would see that, but. Um, Name dropping is good. For uh, <laughs> I guess I would say, I think one thing to think about, um, some, you asked about the Senate. So I think an actual important thing to understand is, obviously we're a lot of Democratic Senate seats up, but uh, the seats that, tr- putting aside Florida for one moment, uh, Democrats won in states that were close Trump victories and even significant Trump victories like, Ohio, sure, Brown won by six points. Trump had won that state by 10. Obviously, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania. Um, But really importantly, uh, he won, I mean, Democrats were defeated in states that Trump won by 17 to 22 points. So they couldn't overcome a 20-point difference. But in states that were, like, relatively close, Democrats could succeed. And so I think that's an important thing. I also think we should recognize the movements in the in the country. And so there are a lot of states in the South in particular. So I think uh, if, you, if we extrapolate uh, into the future, Democrats are having a harder and harder time in sort of the West um, part of the country. But that's being uh, replaced by Democrats doing well um, I mean, sort of, uh, you know, like the Dakotas, et cetera, where you would choose to have some populist Democratic candidates. But that's being replaced by super competitive races. I mean, the if Democrats can, just to say this, if Democrats can make Trump compete in Arizona, Texas, and Georgia. So if you told me two years ago that Georgia governor's race would be two-point race, that the Texas Senate race would be 2.6, and a Democrat would win Arizona <laughs> statewide, a Democratic uh, who has a pretty progressive past, let's just say, would be the Democratic senator and win, you know, like not by like five votes. You know, in the end of the day, it was like 30,000 votes. Um, I mean, that is that is a presidency realigning the country. And if I want I mean, you know, I'm trying to be fair here, but if I were a Republican and wanted to go into deep panic, I would say that... A Georgia and Texas and Arizona where you have to spend a lot of money in order to defend your position as a president is a problem for a Republican president. And he is realigning. I mean, those states, Texas, you know, there's been a discussion about Texas moving. The fact that Better Work was able to get so close to Ted Cruz, who actually was a pretty popular Republican senator. He's at 45% approval. I mean, I don't like Ted Cruz, but I think... You know, a lot of people don't like Ted Cruz, but actually he's relatively popular in Texas. I mean, that should be something that sets off alarm bells for people who are trying to think through what the actual map is going to be. Now, a lot rests on Democrats putting up candidates who can do that. But just think, an African-American woman in Georgia came within two points of Brian Kemp. So that seems to me like you could argue that a means, like a Democrat could nominate someone like that. I mean, I agree with that, and I think... Rational Republicans think that way. On the other hand, in the real world, Trump's president, it's hard, you know, no one gets to designate uh, the future of the party. I I guess one caveat to this whole discussion uh, I would make, this is assuming kind of business as usual, which I think actually, you know, is usually the case, obviously, that's why it's called business as usual. And, but as we know from other countries too, you can have wild changes in politics within two years or within a year especially if there are wild changes in the world. And I do think there's some chance of that. So let's say there's a recession. What, what, what are the implications of that? The first blush, you would say, is, well, it hurts the incumbent party. It helps the challenger. But I don't know. Maybe it also helps a more radicalized version of Trump. You know, maybe Trump can sort of say, I didn't, they didn't do what I wanted, and now we really need to have 
protectionism. I mean, I, the recessions always help the moderate. Let's have another tax cut. <laughs> yeah, well, That's de- great. <laughs> well, but the recessions, the recessions politically in history always help the sort of moderate, responsible, central-left party. I don't think so, actually. Do foreign policy crises have very, who do they help? They have very unpredictable outcomes. Look, if there's a real crisis, I think people will rally behind the president, including responsible Democrats, if it's really in a showdown with North Korea or something else of that nature, or uh, Putin really does something worse even. And what if Trump, you know, what if things go well, which of course one would hope they would. What if we're in a way rescued by some of our allies, which has happened a little bit actually on the trade issue, I think. So I just would say, and of course populism is a kind of funny beast in the sense that it's not, it's hard to predict where it pops its head up. And every time I read a story that, oh well, populist lost somewhere, and that, that populist threat is you know, fading away. Was that, what was that, Sweden or someplace? And then, you know, two months later, there's an election in Spain. And it's like, oh my God, what happened? You know, and this stuff happens fast, right? And the rise is very, could be very sudden. So I'm, that would be just my general caveat that we're, we're sort of assuming, which I think is the only thing we can assume if we're trying to be, you know, sensible, kind of, you know, that the lessons of 2018 carry over to 2020 and the trends of the last several years carry over. But there are a lot of wild cards out there. Right, I have much uh, much more questions, but we also um, want to open up uh, for the public. We have half an hour to go, 25 minutes to go, and I would um, shoot, please. Uh, I'm Harlan Ullman. My question stems from 2014. Anybody who would have bet that Trump would become president would have made a huge amount of money. Uh, Bill focused on wild cards. Let me give you three that are not wild cards, but will happen. Bob Mueller is going to release his report. It's going to be convict or condone. That's going to have huge impact. Interest rates are going to go up, possibly to 4%, provoking a fiscal crisis. And in foreign policy, there will be a significant event. Kim could come out of the closet and say, we're going to denuclearize. Poroshenko could do something stupid and go either way. So I wonder if you would comment on those three things. Mueller, either way. Interest rates, which are going to go up, and what that's going to do. And thirdly, if there is a foreign policy event that's positive, negative, how that might impact. Well, I'll just go. I mean, look, I totally agree, and I didn't specify them, but I had those in mind. Mueller is a huge event, sort of binary, in the sense that ultimately either there's evidence that would lead mm-hmm. to impeachment proceedings or the consideration of impeachment proceedings in the House uh, or not. And, you know, we could. The not, I mean, there could be stuff that's short of impeachment that's really de- devastating from a normal point of view about how could a presidential candidate behave this way? How could his top advisors behave this way? How could a president behave this way? And yet, if it literally, if there's no impeachment, Trump is going to say, vindication, no collusion, no obstruction. You know, these people I didn't, you know, Manafort, I barely knew him, Cohen, low level lawyer. And now, can he sell that? I don't know. So that's huge. Interest rates. I would say the question then is recession or no recession or inflation conceivably, though that's been gone for quite a while. But again, I come back to the question of recession normally hurts the incumbent party, helps the out party, but you can also imagine, you know, Trump saying, you know, we need more tax cuts. And I don't know, puts the Democrats in a tough position if there's a recession somehow and suddenly they're voting for something that they say, no, no, we need more middle class tax cuts. Trump says, fine, forget about all those corporate people. I never should have helped them so much in the first place. Paul Ryan talked me into it. He's a populist, Trump, right? I mean, there are a lot of, so I very much agree that in all those, and foreign policy, God knows, right, how that plays out. So, I mean, I very much agree that all those are wild cards. I don't have a very high opinion of Trump's uh, uh, judgment, and therefore I kind of doubt that he'll end up playing any of these things terribly well, but he's not without cunning, and he's got, de- in a weird way, the people who I admire who are working in the Trump administration to try to make it more responsible could end up doing a pretty good job managing these things. Let's say in Mattis and Pompeo, you could do worse, you know, in terms of trying to deal with a crisis, and Trump just lets them deal with it in a responsible way, and maybe, you know, something weird happens, we get lucky. And suddenly it's like, see, Trump was right. You know, America first. Uh, I guess I have a slightly different take. I I actually think, Bill, you're completely underestimating how much the economy is propping Trump up right now. And so, so central to his argument uh, amongst Republicans and I would even argue amongst the kind of reluctant Republicans is that the economy is doing real well right now and the tribalism of hating on Democrats. And so really the economy, I think, really keeps that the Republic. I mean, you would know better than me about the Republican coalition, but just from public polling data, that is a 
big reason why he's at 45 and not 35. And so I think a recession is deeply, deeply problematic and uh, for him because it, it actually, you know, I think we underestimate how much for base Republican voters, it's like a straight line from businessman to good on the economy. And if he goes from businessman to bad on the economy, uh, and I, I even think the plant closings in Ohio actually are going to are chipping away at the, these kinds of arguments for him. I think that is going to be a fundamental problem for him. So I don't wish for a recession, um, uh, but you know I would say I think it's pretty clear cut that that would hurt him. And he made an argument that his big tax plan would create growth for decades to come. And if it, it's proven wrong, that's another thing that people will hold against him. On, uh, I would just one foot, I, I kind of agree with that, actually. Maybe I was, I would say, yeah, I, I, I think that's probably right. We tested in Iowa, this is sort of interesting, uh, what issues would matter to voters in Iowa and New Hampshire and a couple of other states. And of course, one forgets it's a big country and people have different interests. The tariff issue hurt in Iowa more than I expected. Yeah. And this was prospective. This was three months ago. People were realizing that, gee, you know, we're farmers or we're dependent on the farm economy if we're, you know, running stores and small farm towns and so forth. And so that would testify to your point. I very much agree. The whole Trump mystique is he's a businessman. He knows what he's doing. We were growing at one and a half or two percent for eight years. Let's leave aside the truth of that and the, who is to blame for that and all that. And now we're gunning, uh, we're going out all cylinders. And that's what Trump could do in the White House. So I, I think on more consideration, yeah. so I'll just probably say really right. quickly on the other two things, I would say on Mueller, I think that the, you know, that's like a, the before and after of Mueller, the day before, the day after are completely diff different things. I mean, I don't know that it'll be a condoning report. That strikes me as a little bit much. But I think I think the public's perceptions, even of moderate Republicans, will be shaped by uh, of, uh, the level of specificity in the report. And I actually think, like, it doesn't need to get to impeachment. If, if Mueller lays out a case of illegal behavior, I think that will hurt Trump and hurt Trump considerably. Uh, and Democrats will, I, I can say two things about Nancy Pelosi to... First of all, she's not anxious to impeach. I think she will likely investigate all the claims and hope to get Republican support at some point, but she will not rush to impeachment. You know, just remind everyone her lived experience of speakers who uh, pursued impeachment is that both two of them went down in short order. So just to say that, I also would say uh, she's just as a th broad point, you know, she's going to push issues in the caucus that unify the caucus which are probably not going to scare the bejesus out of a lot of voters, but that's a, a broad take. And then your third issue on national security, obviously we have no idea. I would say national security events don't tend to dictate, unless we're like drawn into a war or something, dictate uh, what happens. I, I mean, truthfully, I find this a depressing fact, and probably most people who work in public policy, particularly foreign policy, find it depressing, but the issue of North Korea did not move voters one way, or another beyond like a four day cycle. So when we're like in war baiting, <laughs> when we're having like basically war tweets and people didn't care that much. And when he had an agreement, which turned out to be a fake agreement, that didn't matter that much. It, it was, it, those things don't, I mean, you just, it's, which is unfortunate, but people don't, like, unless they see a war, they don't see those things. November 89, Harlan knows this, November 89 to December 91, I would say, was one of the best performances by an American president in national security and foreign policy in history, really. We're in the top five, maybe, with FDR for a couple of years and with Truman for a couple of years. I mean, think of that. And of course, George Bush got 38% of the vote in 1992. So that sort of fits with Nero's point. Let's get another question over here, please. Hi, I'm uh, Justin Guest. I'm a professor at George Mason University. And uh, I spent quite a bit of time with white working class people for my research. And for every one of those voters, um, that Bill was discussing who uh, are Republicans and who broadly like the president but will feel uncomfortable with the second term. There are also voters who probably supported Democrats in the midterm election, um, which makes you think that maybe they're actually susceptible to being poached back by the Democratic Party. But when faced with a two choice vote uh, at the top of the ticket, um, are gonna look at the Democrats four years from 2016 and say, what is the alternative here? because their vote for Trump in many cases was a gamble against the status quo. The Democrats don't look very different from they did two years ago. Are they going to look that different two years from now? And I ask you guys with each of your different hats on, Nir, I wonder if you could discuss this from you know, an organization that advises the Democratic Party quite closely. 
on what kind of alternative they can be while actually maintaining their base that actually doesn't necessarily want them to change maybe that much, I don't know. And, and Bill, from your perspective, what would Democrats have to do, you think, to actually win back the voters that were so attracted to Trump in these places, like you were mentioning, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Michigan? You know, so I think this is a, 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 a great question. I guess I would turn it back to you. Why do you think those candidates, this Gretchen Whitmer got like, a, a, you know, 20% of her voters were people, because uh, they, uh, just to say this, you normally you can't really extrapolate that much from a midterm from a presidential because it's 50% versus, you know, it's like a midterm is like, can be like 60% of a presidential. This midterm was 80%, closer to 80%. So you have a lot of people who voted for Donald Trump two years ago and then voted for Gretchen Whitmer, Tony Evers, and, you know, I would say just, to give the per kind of perfect example for uh, <laughs> Sherrod Brown. So I think the Democratic Party will have a full and robust debate. And just to say this, I think the, the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth issue for Democratic voters is going to be who can beat Trump. It is not. I, Democratic voters in primaries around this country were incredibly practical. They did not go for the candidate. Liberals did not vote for the candidate who they agree with in every issue. They voted for the candidate who they thought could win that district. So there was robust primary challenges from the left, from the moderate group, from the moderate side of the party, and in cities where there wasn't competitive races. Democrats went with uh, younger, more diverse. Uh, more left candidates. But in swing districts, almost to a T, Democrats went with, not everywhere, but mostly went with prosecutors, veterans, people who are outside the political process. And a lot of these people won. And I think the Democratic Party will have a robust debate about who can, which candidate can do the best to put together a coalition. I guess... I would say that I judge parties by their swing races. And I would say I don't, I think if you look at the swing districts that have the people like Max Rose or Abigail Spanberger or Alyssa Slotkin or Haley Stevens or Antonio Delgado's African American Road Scholar, who was hit with a lot of what I would say is just racist attacks in a district that was like 95% white and won pretty handily. That is the future of the Democratic Party. And I do not understand why those candidates cannot do well, or candidates like that cannot do well, a Sherrod Brown can't do well, a Beta Work can't do well with a coalition. I just don't see it. If yeah, but look, I mean, I, I, don't, I think the, pre the people I'm talking about are upper middle class suburban voters. They're the, they're the swing voters, they're the ones in that focus group. Trump's gonna win the white working class, overwhelmingly in my opinion, in 2020. There's no sign of, there's a tiny bit of erosion among white working class women in Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. So far as one can tell, that gets a little hard to do. You have to really look at the voter file studies. But nationally, the red areas were as red as they were in 2016, and Trump, won the states that, as Nira said, he, he elected Republican candidates in states that were Trumpy. And in Trumpy areas, like in a state like Minnesota, where you Republicans only state which Republicans picked up seats, they picked up two seats in Trump areas, and they lost two seats in upper middle class suburban areas. So it's almost like a perfect case study. Scott Walker increased his vote, losing the Wisconsin governor race in Trump areas, basically rural areas, and then got clobbered and lost as a result in suburban areas. The Democrats just don't need, though. the truth is though, the Democrats can win with their 2018 coalition. I don't think there's much chance of getting back in the current social cultural configuration of the country, absent maybe a big economic recession, which really drives the working class, makes the working class voters feel they paid a price for the gamble they took. But right now, they're not paying any price, and they like Trump on the social and cultural issues, and they don't like the Democrats. So I, I don't, that is a longer term question. But that's why, incidentally, if Ben Sass is the nominee, I'll be extremely happy. It'd be good for the country. We'll have dodged a bullet, I think, if Trump is a one term president. But longer term, am I confident that the country is going to be back to, quote, normal, and we're going to end up with 2024, 2028 featuring normal races? No, it could be Italy. 
Trump is Berlusconi, you get beyond that, you survive it, and then four or six or eight years later, I don't know the exact chronology, you end up with uh, whatever that party's called or coalition of parties is called. What if Trump loses, the Democrats win, the interest rates are going up, there's really a nasty recession in 2021, 2022, where something goes awry in the world, which God knows can happen, right? What does the Republican Party look like in 2024? I hope it's a Ben Sass, you know, at all, you know, uh, Jeff Flake, uh, Governor Hogan, Governor Baker, Governor, or even Rick Scott, let's say, you know, relatively sane Republican Party. But I don't know, couldn't you get Trump on a younger, smarter, more focused version of Trump? in 2024, appealing to populist resentments. That's really what happened in Italy. That's what's happening in some other countries in Europe. And I think you could get that. Uh, Irish ambassador to the United States. Um, could I just, on the, on the theme of understanding uh, America, uh, could I ask about the gender issue? Because for me, that's the standout um, um, figure that I've seen. I've seen the figures about the gap between women and men in their sort of voting preferences. It's something I don't think exists anywhere else to quite the same extent. I mean, in most countries, it's it's demography. It's older people tend to vote a certain way, younger people a different way. If you look at Brexit, that's what happened. More educated people voted uh, to remain. Less educated people voted um, uh, to leave. Um, you know, so, so how has America got into a situation where women and men uh, view the world of politics so radically differently? Is it just the influence of the president or no. Is it that women actually, American women, see the world of politics totally differently from uh, from men? Do they not talk to each other around the <laughs> dinner table or, so, or whatever they meet? <laughs> I mean, it goes way back. The gender gap has been there since 1980. Women are more dovish than men, more compassionate than men, more pro-big government than men, welfare state programs. And that's been pretty consistent. And actually, I, for all the talk about suburban women, the actual gender gap is not that much bigger in this election than it has been in a lot of previous American elections. The education gap ballooned and that really is big and the class gap if you want to call it that and the youth versus old gap those things are much bigger so why america as opposed to other advanced uh, democracies has this gender gap the truth is most married couples uh, some check each other's uh, cancel each other's ballot most vote alike i think the studies show that we unmarried women are much more the gap between unmarried women and married women has always been greater than the gap between women and men. So younger unmarried women, for both cultural and social reasons, and I think economic reasons, are less pro-business, more pro-government, whatever simplification one wants to use, uh, and men sort of the opposite. But but I don't know that the gender gap, I think, has actually been too much. And I, don't know I, 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 focus think on it, that. I think the gap is actually larger than you are suggesting for 2018. I think you're probably closer to 20. I mean, I think there's been gaps, but in 2018, I mean, if you even take college educated versus non-college, so Bill is absolutely right. The difference, if you take amongst white voters, the difference between college educated voters and non-college educated voters is a is the deepest chasm in American politics state amongst white voters. So it's like a 30 point difference. Um, and interestingly, you know, Republican men are now 50-50. Nobody talks, I mean, not Republican, college educated men. Right. Uh, white men are now 50-50. They used to be 70-30. So what's actually happening is the tracking in American politics is like this. Uh, Demo the most Democratic is amongst white voters. College-educated white women. College-educated white men. Non-college-educated white women. Non-college-educated white men. If you look from one perspective, there's a gender gap across the board, right? So non-college-educated women in 2018 voted 10 to 15 points more for Democrats than non-college educated men. Um, you know, non-college educated white women were basically like 60-40, uh, 62-38. So there is, a bit, there is a big gender gap. Uh, the, you, I think the way to think about it is the, the education gap, not even income gap, education gap, is the deepest chasm in American politics, I would argue, followed basically by gender. Um, that was less true in 2016, more true in 2018. And I'd say women are, I'd say there's a whole group of women voters who took Donald Trump figuratively, not literally, and have been shocked, shocked, profoundly surprised 
that they took him, that they that he has been as he governed. A lot of voters thought he would be like, oh, that's just an act. He'll be serious. And like the tweeting drives him crazy. And then the health care, you know, they didn't think he would like do anything to take anyone's health care away. And uh, those voters have moved. And now they might move back with a choice. But I think just on Trump, they have deep reservations. So just for the procedure, we have time for one more question before we wrap up. And we have one over here. Hi, my name is Courtney Bickard. I'm with the German Marshall Fund. Um, one question, there are two issues I hadn't heard raised today, and I'm curious if they have any play in what's going to happen in the next two years and how voters are going to view both the president and Congress. Um, and that is human rights, both internationally and in the US, as they relate to women's rights, as they wait, um, relate to LGBT. LGBTQ, um, and also international human rights, as we saw with the murder of Khashoggi, um, and also climate change, and whether that has a role to play in the upcoming elections and, and two years. Uh, I'm happy to start. Uh, you know, I think that, I think actually, um, you know, I think if you ask people human rights per se, that might, uh, that might seem esoteric to people, but if you actually, I, I, I think the fundamental criticism of Trump is essentially an argument about whether America is going to have inclusive policies or exclusive policies. I mean, fundamentally, we're having pretty core debates in the United States about who Americans or who's really American, uh, whether it's America is really what, you know, America should be defined by being open to immigration and equality between men and women and civil rights for all people, or is it that, you know, essentially a lot, you know, white guys are kind of oppressed. And I, I think of fundamentally, like if you actually looked at the campaigns, um, we spent a lot of time looking at these congressional races, a lot of these candidates who won, and even the most in swing districts were basically articulating a sort of positive patriotism that was about uniting the country against divisive politics. So that was definitely true in Beto O'Rourke's campaign. That was definitely true. But it, even in these congressional campaigns, there really was a focus about kind of an alternative vision of politics that was much more inclusive of people. So women's rights and treating LGBTQ folks equally and caring about equality for people. And, you know, just to say, um, you know, he's kind of an interesting candidate right now in the Democratic Party. Better work got, uh, in Texas, where he lost by 2.6%, got 75% of Latinos to vote for him. No Democrat has done so well amongst Latinos in Texas. I mean, no Republican either, obviously. But Dem Republicans in Texas have gotten 40% of Latinos in the past. He's running against Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz is actually, you know, Latino. And uh, it doesn't, like, talk about it all that much, but did in this campaign, definitely talked about it in this campaign. And... Uh, better work, a white candidate was able to kind of put back together the uh, the Obama coalition with a lot more white college educated women voting for him. So, so I think that you know I think fundamentally I'm not sure human rights or is a way to think about that, but I think fundamentally the 2020 debate will be about two I, I, whoever the Democrat is is going to articulate a critique of Donald Trump's divisiveness and how it is bad for America and does not re represent what America should be. And every single candidate will do that. Well, I'm pretty worried from the point of view of someone who's, a, I'd say, a conservative internationalist, but is certainly a pro-human rights internationalist and have worked a lot with liberals on, on a lot, had common ground with liberals on many, many issues going way back to the Balkans intervention where McCain and Dole were with Clinton against the Buchanan wing of the Republican Party and against the non-intervention swing of the Democratic Party. Objectively, I would say, I mean, I remember when President Obama gave the Afghan, the speech justifying the surge <clears throat> in Afghanistan, but then he also justified getting, announcing a withdrawal at the same time. Uh, he said, we can't do this forever. I, I supported the surge. He said, you can't do this forever. Nation building has to begin at home. And I happen to know pretty well a very senior person in the Obama White House. 
And I said, God, I just wish he hadn't said that. I mean, that is going to be, that is going to come back to haunt you. That is Pat Buchanan. That is going to be the Republican candidate. And you know, to Romney's great credit, incidentally, and he got beat up by this. And Biden defeated Paul Ryan in the vice presidential debate on this. Romney and Ryan didn't go for the cheap you know, well, they're wasting all this money abroad stuff. But Trump sure did, and he saw the opportunity. Hillary Clinton had to back off on TPP. She didn't, I mean, she, she, she I think, hung in fairly tough on liberal internationalism, mostly. Um, there wasn't much of an issue in the campaign. And, I mean, Trump tried to make it an issue. I don't know if it really made a difference in the in the vote. But I'm pretty worried in both parties. I mean, it's, it, the Republican you know, a lot depending on Reagan's leadership and then McCain and Dole and a lot of other people for, to make the Republicans a pretty pro-human rights party in a more conservative context in terms of foreign policy. Uh, Democrats have, uh, have always been more inclined in that direction in a certain way, but also not inclined when it comes to sort of maybe uh, some tough decisions. And I am worried that you could end up with the Democrats deciding this is just too risky to run on in 2020. And so both party, neither party articulates any seriousness. I mean, it's, and, and con leaving aside the voters who maybe don't care much about this, it'll be interesting to see in Congress. I mean, does Nancy, and I'm not even saying this critically, I think it's a tough choice for her. Does Nancy Pelosi make any aspect of a human rights oriented, democracy oriented critique of Trump's foreign policy a priority in 20? 19. And do any Republicans, for that matter, in the Senate, as the new chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Corker was at least, was sort of okay with this, not very excited about it. I wouldn't say the new chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations looks to me like someone who's going to do this. Um, so I'm pretty worried about liberal internationalism and conservative internationalism over the next couple of years. Thank you so much. Before I let you go, I have a very easy question to both of you and just a very short answer. Who is going to be the candidate of the Democrats? Is Beto O'Rourke going to run? I have no idea. Is he going to, uh, is he going to run? I think it's uh, 60 per I don't know. I think he's likely to run. Uh, I mean, you know, the, the big <laughs> problem answer. for Democrats. <laughs> yes, I like, know. The, oh, the, 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 just to say one word about this, one sentence, literally. The biggest challenge for limiting the number of Democrats running for president is that all these people get up every day and look at Donald Trump and say, I could do a better job. Right. <laughs> Including rich businessmen and others who don't quite see why Trump gets to be president when they were more successful in business and are more sane human beings. So and less it will corrupt. Be, it will be, yeah, so it'll be an interesting, I'll make one sen two sentence prediction about the Democratic primary. We are all used on the Republican side to winner take all, which tends to meet mean an early or reasonably early knockout as happened with Trump. You know, Jeb loses and early and you got to get out. Democratic side, for sort of almost accidental reasons, I would say in 2008 and 2016 was a two person race, Hillary and uh, Obama and then Hillary and Sanders in 2016. I actually think if you look at the proportional representation and yeah, the number of perfect. candidates on the Democratic side, it could go on a long time. People could, you know, the, the first few races will be 19%, 16%, 15%, 13%, 11%, 9%, and they're not going to get out. In the old days, you had to get out because you couldn't raise money. Uh, you couldn't get media. This day and age and the internet and stuff, you can raise money, enough money to stay in. You'll get some, if you're Beto, you don't do so well in Iowa, New Hampshire, maybe you get out, but you're worried that you look bad if you don't, well, and well, you also may think, I'll stay until Texas. And you know what? What if there is a not, what if no one has a majority going into the convention? So my offbeat prediction will be, there will not be a majority, a, the Democrats will have an, it will not be clear who the Democratic nominee is going to the Democratic convention. We'll have an old-fashioned convention with actual bargaining. The superdelegates get to vote, like Nira will be one, right? Get to vote on the I second. I'm not a superdelegate. Uh, I think of you. When I, when I hear the word superdelegate, I think of Nira Tandon, you know? <laughs> and she'll get to vote on the second ballot, and we'll have like a multi-ballot Democratic uh, primary which will be, convention, which will be exciting. Thank you very much. It's much easier in Germany. It's uh, no, almost no one is running for uh, becoming the uh, party leader of the CDU end of this week. So I uh, thank you very much for your uh, for being here. And uh, um, it will be an interesting day for Germany today um, with the auto buses in in the town. And we haven't talked about trade, but um, but I guess we will have more discussions. And I thank GMF for organizing this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.